King of Spain. Castle. What is it? Really? The first grizzly bear sighting in Valley Center. The earliest known re recorded sighting of a grizzly bear in Valley Center occurred in March 1854 during the first official government survey of the region. Twelve years later, in 1866, the largest California grizz grizzly in history was observed and shot in Valley Center. The surveyor's notes. On the bottom of this page, read one grizzly bear and two cubs. The site today is along the Old Castle Road, was one one mile east of I-15. That's wild. That's so cool. We just drove right past there. Yep. And we would go past there on the way home. Oh man! Just don't slip. You might cut yourself. Uh, just might. Yeah. Stagecoach days in Valley Center, 1857 to 1912. Stagecoach passengers often had to get off the coach and help push or pull the wagon up or down the hill. The so-called Z grade later became Valley Center Road from Escondido to Valley Center. Four stage lines provide service to Valley Center, 1857 to 1912. Until the appearance of the automobile and bus in the early 1900s, stagecoach travel was how one got around. Mud wagons or horse-drawn coaches offered slow and dusty service. The Valley Center area was served by several local and regional companies. They included Butterfield Overland Stage Company, Pickwick Stage Line, Thorpe and, da and Dane Stage Dine. Line, and Poway and Escondido Stage Line. Interesting. It took a change of horses to get from San Diego to Valley Center. The long, difficult drive from San Diego to Valley Center was described in this newspaper story dated July 6, 1895. Quote, the Poway and Escondido Stage Lines provides daily transportation from the San Diego via Poway to Escondido except Sunday. The trip starts at 8.20 a.m. at Fifth Avenue and F Street and arrives in Poway at 1 p.m. After lunch, the passengers, a fresh team of horses, take the stage to Escondido, arriving there at 4 p.m. The fare is $1, then on to Valley Center for an additional $1. Wagons rolled on six rows in Valley Center. Stagecoaches and mud wagons operated along a number of Valley Center roads from 1857 to 1912. The primary routes were on Lilac Road, the oldest dating to 1857. Bear Valley Road, now Lake Wolford Road, McNally Road, Bettsworth Road, Powell Road, Highway 76, and Rincon Road, now Valley Center Road. That's so cool. And you know, the Butterfield uh, Overland Stage Company, there's a road named that over there by the Agwanga Hot Springs in the Anzaborigo Desert. Yeah, it's the stagecoach route that went all yeah, the way and through. Yeah, also it, um, okay, Oak something, it's on 79 going towards, um, let's see, is it, I think it's a little before you get to Sunshine Summit. They have a stagecoach museum there. Oh, we have got it's to go there. Field. We've got to go there. Way station artifacts. These items were uncovered during excavation near Lilac and Anthony Roads. We lived on Anthony Road. Yeah, that's so, that's where the stagecoach house was. Yeah. This once was the site of a stagecoach way station. It is believed that it was either a rest stop for passengers or a post where fresh horses were changed. Well, we spent a lot of time picnics from yep. my earliest days to when I met my husband. Mail delivery, 1858 to 1861. A contractor for the Butterfield Stage Line delivered mail in Valley Center and Palma Valley along the southern route. From Fort Yuma at the California-Arizona border, the mail stage traveled along McNally Road in Valley Center, crossed the San Luis Rey River into Palma Valley, then called at the Agua Tibia Ranch in Pala. The trail continued to Temecula. This route was abandoned with the start of the Civil War. Other stage lines continued operating until 1912. So when we're going up to your house in Anza, that's what we're passing, correct? Uh -huh. Look at this, these maps. Well, this tells you right here about okay, this, this these says, artifacts came from that stagecoach this, house this, over off of Anthony Road. I better start reading. Right here. I mean... So that's so cool. This well, came. Okay, the, well, the, the route went that way. Yeah. Through Sir Anthony Road and came up. And, oh, wow. Actually, the 
to come I, I can turn on the program. After arriving at their homestead claim in Valley Center in the late 1860s, many immigrants emigrants lived in their wagon until they completed construction of their cabin. Emigrants. Most important to spell, pronounce it differently. 1862 Settler's Cabin. After crossing the country by wagon train and with few possessions, early pioneers in Valley Center quickly set up housekeeping in quarters similar to this cabin. They generally were sparsely furnished. The White House Cookbook. Valley Center Women, the single most important event in California history, occurred January 24, 1848, when James Marshall, foreman at Sutter's Mill, found a nugget on the American River during a routine inspection of the construction site. He gave it to his housekeeper and cook, Elizabeth Jane, Jenny Wimmer, who knew how to test for gold using a folk method of lye soap. The next morning, Jenny Wimmer emptied the soap kettle and lifted out the gold piece. Bright as it could be, she declared, the California gold rush was on. Fame and fortune bypassed Mrs. Wimmer. She and her husband, Peter, head of the construction crew at Sutter's Mill, left the area and eventually homesteaded in Valley Center. Jenny died unknown in virtual poverty in 1885 and is buried at Valley Center Cemetery. The original gold nugget was purchased by the University of California. With James Marshall, she is credited by the California State Library as the co-discoverer of California gold. An account of the first discovery of gold by Captain John Sutter refers to the gem as the Wimmer Nugget. Pretty amazing. The old mining company stock certificate. Gold prospecting with a dry washer. Valley Center man started Nevada Gold Rush. Mining engineer and prospector Ernest L. Cross, who lived on Paradise Mountain Road, made a historic and famous discovery in 1904, gold. It was called one of the biggest gold strikes in the history of Nevada. He and a partner, also a prospector, established the town of Rhyolite and are credited with launching the famed 1904 gold rush. Rhyolite is now a ghost town and famous tourist attraction. In Valley Center, Cross was a well-known rancher and community activist for 35 years. He died in 1958, age 86. Mom, wow. very interesting, because this is Paradise Mountain Road. This guy who started the Nevada Gold Rush. I wonder if that's that property you guys are looking at. No, Paradise Valley Road is where Jim lives. Oh, I didn't know that, down towards Hellhole Canyon? Yeah. Wow. Agnes White as Betty Crocker. The fictional character Betty Crocker was created in 1921. That same year, Agnes White, age 26, was the first person hired in the new home service department. She set up the first test kitchen, gave the first cooking demonstration, and later became the voice of the cooking icon when the Betty Crocker Cooking School of the Air was broadcast nationwide on NBC. Huh. Was she from Valley Center? Yeah, Agnes White Tizard. Of Valley Center, the first national spokesman of Betty Crocker. This is such an interesting museum, Mom. Oh, my goodness. These are the best museums. <sighs> the Gold Medal Experimental Kitchen, another guardian of gold medal quality. Wasn't Anna Green Gables like a... Con wasn't there like a thing about the gold medal writing competition that oh, she yeah. won? It, it was a gold medal. Look at the recipe in her own hand. The first radio script. Betty Crocker was introduced on October 2nd, day after your birthday, 1924, on a radio program called the Betty Crocker Cooking School of the Air. The first program was heard in Minneapolis within a year. It was broadcast nationally on NBC radio. Home economist Agnes White prepared the recipes and prepared, portrayed Betty Crocker.
the Great Valley Center Cattle Drive of 1884. Yeah. Remembering the cattle drives of the 19th century. With the advent of the railroad in 1880s, cattle drives became unnecessary. That era lives on, however, in film and art with images of sunburned cowboys and clouds of dust kicked up by cattle. And Rancho Wajita uh -huh. remains a working cattle ranch where our friends live. No, and that, the Wajita. But they don't live on the Wajita. They live next door to it. But they're still cattle ranches. They're mini cattles. <laughs> no, they still got their uh, Watusis, too. Wow. What's a Watusi? The ones with the big horns. I saw those as we were coming back. Mm -hmm. Cattle Drive Route, Oklahoma Territory to Valley Center. This cattle drive followed the Texas California Cattle Trail and included trails along the Rio Grande, Pecos, and Gila Rivers. Spring Gila. 1884. What do you say? Gila. Gila. Departed Oklahoma Territory, crossed West Texas to El Paso, crossed southwestern New Mexico to Las Cruces, drove along eastern edge of, I cannot pronounce that, Chihuahuan Desert. Chihuahua. Okay. Chihuahua the dog. Okay. Entered southern Arizona via Apache Pass, that's pretty treacherous, crossed along Sonora Desert near Mexican border, passed near Tucson and Yuma, passed through Imperial Valley, entered San Diego County, arrived at Bear Valley, Valley Center, Rancho Wajita. The cattle drive to Valley Center. The cattle drive symbolizes the romanticism of the Old West, but it lasted only about 20 years. One of the grandest drives was the 1884 trek from the Oklahoma Territory to Rancho Wajita and Valley Center. Some 2,000 steer were brought here in a drive that took nearly six months. The trek began in the spring as grass was available. Some days the drive would cover 10 to 15 miles. Here's how they got here. Leaving the Oklahoma Territory, the crew followed a southern route through El Paso towards San Diego. Okay, so when we were riding on the Jeregi's property down, I was talking about that last time we visited, yeah. and we saw that old ranch house. Is that a part of the cattle drive? No, that's not part of Valhita at all. Okay, what was that abandoned ranch? I really don't know, but it's it burned down. It's so I sad. Know that. A famous saddle and its famous cowboy owner. This is a historic roping saddle that was used at every major rodeo, frontier show, and fair for 20 years starting in 1915. It was owned by Edgar H. Wright, who lived in Valley Center and is buried at Valley Center Cemetery. I definitely want to go check that place out. Is that? No. Ed Wright, 1889 to 1975, was the cowboy, rodeo clown, and vaudeville star. Oh, my kind of guy. With Barnum and Bailey Circus, he conceived most of the clown stunts used today in circuses. That is awesome. He later became a rancher in Valley Center. His life as a cowboy rodeo clown is detailed in a three volume book, Pardoners. We gotta read those books, Mom. Pardoners. A sign at his home in Valley Center and on his cemetery marker read, End of the Trail. So cool. Donated in memory of rodeo clown Philip H. Pop Bauer of Valley Center. In photo left, Ed Wright, Martha Bauer, Virginia Stoops Wright. Other colorful cowboys who are buried at Valley Center Cemetery. Lionel Red Bernadine, 1970-1976. Otto Pop Gardner, 1900-1975. Bone, Brown to Breakfast, Valley Center Cowboy Ed Wright is featured in this 1908 paint Painting by Charles M. Russell, the famed cowboy artist often called the greatest painter of the Old West. The representative. Wyatt Earp in Valley Center. Wow. The legendary folk hero of the Old West, Wyatt Earp, was a regular visitor to the Valley Center home of his niece, Peggy McNally. She was said to be as colorful a character as she was her famous uncle. This photograph was taken about 1926. In 1920, Peggy built a large adobe house on a 310-acre parcel. The home still stands on McNally Road, part of the Staley Ranch. McNally went, is where? It is. McNally was once a popular route of the Pickwick stage lines. Earp died in 1929. McNally died in 1968. 
Valley Center cowboy and rodeo star Ed Wright was the model for many paintings by Charles M. Russell, said by many to be the greatest painter of the Old West. Russell was a cowboy before becoming a full-time artist. Ed Wright is featured at left in Wild Horse Hunting and above in When the Nose of a Horse Beats the Eyes of a Man.